Hello, everyone. It is Jeff Seidman, and welcome to Optimizing Aging. And as usual, I have my co-hosts, Drew Avery and Brad Waddle. We are all three the 1997 Body of Work co-champions. And today, we're going to start off our talk by talking about fat loss. And we're going to go into more detail on fat loss because 95% of the population over 40 years old is overweight and approximately 75% of the population over 40 years old is obese. So we know that is the number one problem facing the majority of the population for people our age. Again, I'm 63 years old, Drew is 61 and Brad is 55. So if you're a more mature individual, you can relate to what we're doing. So we're gonna start off with Drew. So Drew, I'd like you to talk about very specific details about what you did to lose such an extraordinary amount of body fat in such a short period of time. Well, okay. Good to be here, Jeff. <clears throat> and um, yeah, I wanted to break this, um, my fat loss strategy into a couple categories at least. And one was what I did originally um, for the contest and ultimately what I transitioned to for more of a long-term play for fat loss and maintenance. And when I started the contest, um, I, I think the, the profile would have been something along the lines of 50% protein, 30% carbs, 20% fat, uh, generally speaking. Uh, and um, because... And how many, the, how many, approximately how many calories was that? Well, uh, initially, because I was trying to cut the fat, uh, I wasn't necessarily in a bulking stage, but I'd say that would be... Um, let's see. Uh, it was right around uh, 2,000 calories, I think, at the time. It wasn't a tremendous amount, okay. but about 2,000 calories. Mm -hmm. um, and again, noting for fat loss, uh, if it was a bulking stage, it would have been more calories. But And, and I want to interrupt one more time, yeah. but, but it's also 2,000 calories based on you doing intense exercise. So if you weren't doing the intense exercise, it would have been a lower amount of calories. But anyways. Yes, so, true. Yeah. Absolutely. Good point. And so what I found, though, with that uh, approach was I was having to do more cardio. And as we've talked in the past couple of uh, times we've been together, I did a fair amount of cardio. Brad didn't. I did. Um, as, and there was times I was even doing cardio twice a day. I found that with uh, the diet using the carbs um, or implementing carbs, I had to do the cardio. But I also found that I... It, it did better in terms of a muscle pump. Um, even uh, I just felt better um, with that with that combination. However, uh, about the last week to week and a half, I would transition to more of a keto, a very low carb approach, um, and maintaining that cardio. And it, so it really would pull down the fat hard on that last week with that um, balancing act that you do when you have that hard gain muscle and you're trying to get that fat loss, you don't want to dig into that hard gain muscle. So is there kind of a, uh, a fine line there? But typically I had to go a more of a keto style approach that last week, really to dig into that last lay, last, last little bit around the waist to get that six pack really in. Now, uh, I found though long-term, I didn't want to be doing that much cardio. Um, and so as I transitioned to more what I consider to be a maintenance phase, uh, my body did well with low carb. And when I say low carb, I would classify that as really keto approach, but we would also know it as paleo. And I actually, uh, before they called it the carnivore diet, I experimented a little with that only because I felt like um, the meat products uh, and fat allowed me to really not calorie count at all. So I was just eating to satisfy my hunger without any real concern about getting insulin spikes, um, causing fat gain. And it kept me in a, in a really lean state. I was having to do little or no cardio and still maintaining, um, uh, low body fat and uh, low body fat. I define as, eight to 10, you know, kind of hovering in that area. And if I ever needed to get ready for something, I, I could dial it in very quickly and give myself a couple of weeks. So I was always kind of within range of a, a photo shoot or something during that time. 
Um, what I'm, what I found though is uh, if I did keto or a paleo, uh, it was important that um, I was including uh, salads, not necessarily starchy carbohydrates like rice and bread and pasta, eliminating that, but really focusing on uh, vegetables, salads, and a meat or protein source. That worked very well for me. And it, it almost eliminated my need for cardio. Uh, and I'll wrap this up so we can get on to Brad, but I found that in the long term, though, when they started really start studying what keto and this paleo kind of approach is doing, even though it, it, many people do well with it, there are some long term health effects that you really have to take in consideration, cancer being one of them. You know, you're keeping your body in a very acidic state. So um, I've moved away from the keto approach. Uh, and tried to balance it out between uh, moderate car uh, starchy carbohydrates, more salads, more vegetables, and a moderate amount of protein. Um, so, so I just have a couple questions for you. Oh, I have a couple questions for you before we move on to Brad. So, can you tell uh, go into more specifics about you said fifty percent protein uh, out of a two thousand calorie a day diet, but what were your specific proteins that you ate and what were your specific carbohydrates and what were your specific fats? Well, okay. So, um, as it, if we go into contest mode, then that was basically chi uh, chicken and fish. Starchy carbs was typically uh, yams or sweet potatoes or brown rice. And um, as far as the fats go, um, I... I don't know. I think as I, cause I know I'm thinking back on this. Yeah. I, I remember I was even supplementing with some omega threes uh, just to make sure I had mm -hmm. enough fat. I wasn't eating a lot of fat per se. Oh, you know, the other thing I, I hadn't even thought about, I was, I stayed away from dairy during that time, entire time, no dairy. So mm -hmm. um, I'm just trying to think. I really didn't, I, I if I remember correctly, I did um, even add some olive oil to get up to that, uh, you know, 20% uh, fat. But I wasn't really specifically eating fat. It was just whatever I could get on maybe uh, if I didn't do a chicken breast, I might do a thigh. But uh, primarily, I think the, the carbs to focus on that worked well for me is brown rice. But I loved yams. Oh, and also but when you uh, went into the, the re Go ahead. Yeah, but when you went into the real cutting phase, trying to get your body fat, you know, as low as possible, get shredded, that's when you stopped the yams, you stopped the rice, and you went into fibrous, low-calorie, nutrient-rich vegetables. Absolutely, yes. I found that, that that worked well. Those That was yeah. enough carbohydrate to sustain me, uh, but not so much that it was disrupting uh, my fat loss. Okay. Okay, that was good. Plus, I think it's healthier, right by the way. Nice. I think it's just healthier. You know, you should be eating the vegetables. You're just not going to get some things just from the meat. It is. So, so. Brad, uh, basically, same question, you know. Uh, can you go into detail about what you did? Because both of you guys uh, did incredible. And if anybody goes back and looks at the pictures, they'll see you guys went from, I don't know, you guys were probably between 25 and 30% body fat, and you went down to single digit body fat in 12 weeks. And so what you guys did, anybody can do it, and they will experience very similar results. It doesn't matter what their metabolism is or, or, or even their genetics. You follow that same protocol, you're gonna get very similar results. But you guys also, I will say, especially with the aid of the competition doing the contest in Lamborghini, um, you guys did this 100%, not 99%. And so, right. um, yeah. And, yeah, so uh, Brad, so if you could go into detail about your uh, nutrition following uh, doing the plan. Yeah, um, so what I did was, um, and, and we're talking about just to get shredded and, and lose fat, I did five to six meals per day. And I didn't, and I didn't necessarily count my calories. I didn't have them. I didn't have it counted out to the, uh, to the exact gram or, um, but what I did do was I would eat the same, pretty much the same thing every day. I'd have, uh, egg whites and oatmeal in the morning. And then my next three meals would be, uh, uh, but, but so, so go into a little more detail, yeah. how many egg whites and how much oatmeal? 
Okay, so I'd have like six egg whites and uh, a cup of oatmeal, and uh, no, nothing, just plain oatmeal, no no sugar, nothing on it. I, I kept everything pretty bland, and and uh, and then uh, my nine o'clock, twelve o'clock, and three o'clock. The next three meals would be one small chicken breast, four to six ounces, um, a handful of rice, and mixed vegetables, frozen mixed vegetables or spinach, something like that. And, uh, come home before. And then my last two meals would be sometimes not always. I'd eat, I'd have a protein shake, like a, a, the myoplex shakes, what I did back then. Um, and then at night I would have six to eight egg whites scrambled up and then that would be, that would be it. So what I would do it, I'd cut my carbohydrates out at the, at nighttime. And, um, and then I would just judge it. And you can tell if you're, if, if you're, if you're in a state of losing fat, I could always tell. And if I, and if I wasn't, what I would do is I'd simply just take a little bit, you know, just, just a small bit out of each little thing that I ate. And, um, so, and, and then, you know, you can, I just always stayed on track like that. And I think another thing is that's really important if you really want to lose as much fat as possible is to is hydration. I think it gets overlooked a little bit, but with hydration, if what I would do and people laugh at this now, but I, I would get, I get it. And I still do it today. I'll get a, a, a one gallon jug um, of water and I'll start full in the morning and then, um, Keep drink, just drink on it all day until and, until it's gone. That way you can you can uh, um, you know track your progress like that. Mm-hmm. So if you, there's a, just a lot of things with hydration. You know your body just runs more efficiently when you're hydrated. Um, allows your kidneys to uh, process and, and get rid of the toxins, which frees up your liver to uh, you know help break down fat. And uh, yeah, hydration, nutrition. And like you, and what I would think the the three biggest things for fat loss, if you want to boil it down and make it simple, you know, I think you got number three, be hydration. You know, you got to stay hydrated, like I I said, and uh, be in a constant state of hydration. Be number three. Number two, of course, your nutrition, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You've got to eat a nutrient dense, well, well well-balanced diet. I think that's number two, you know, that'd be number three and number two. They're important, <clears throat> but probably not the most important thing. But when it comes down to fat loss, um, I think the number one most important aspect of that is, is how determined are you? You, you got to be determined. Like you said, Jeff, you know, we, we didn't do it at 99%. We did it at a hundred percent. And for, for me, that's, that's the, that's the right. three things there. Yeah. And and like uh, Drew and like just like Drew, I stayed completely away from yeah. there. So so. Oh, you know, so Drew. Uh, I, regarding the hydration, did you yeah. focus on that? That's funny. I, I actually wrote down because I wanted to follow up on that one. Uh, no, I, I wasn't as as diligent as Brad is, and I'm impressed that Brad's still doing that. I have to fight to drink that much water, and you know, what's so funny about that is. Uh, and, and now also, Jeff, I'm curious when you work with your clients, um, the people that I've talked with in the past and, and talk about hydration, um, I get a consistent uh, pushback when they try it. And that is, well, first of all, it's fatiguing to, you know, to have to drink all that water all the time. And I'm at work and I can't be going to the bathroom all the time. And I have to admit, that's the one challenge I have as well. If I'm drinking all that, I have to constantly be going to the bathroom and in the LA area, you know, you're on the freeway and that hits. I'm, I'm not ashamed to say I've had to have (laughs) my water bottle there used as a travel pickup because I'm stuck. So that, so Brad, how are you dealing with that? I mean, has your body adjusted or do you find, I I think so. I I think it does, Drew. I think you're and and when you, if you first, like uh, when you first start doing that, it takes it, like you said, you gotta, it's, it's bad, right? Like you're you're constantly going to the bathroom, but I think after a week or so of doing that, your body adjusts, adjusts to that. And uh, it's, it's just kind of like normal at that point, you know? Well, I'm going to have to give that a try, but you know, now you've reminded me of something else that I, you know, we're bringing up old memories here, but it's so funny because, um, what I would do is water load about two days before a photo shoot. 
or yes. you know, something yeah. and really get that pee reflex rolling, you know, mm -hmm. but then immediately stop that water, usually about 24 hours out before yep. whenever I'm doing. Mm -hmm. And that pee reflex, you just pee out all that water um, and it worked beautifully. You yeah. Know, in that sense. Yeah. But I never got to the point. Now you've got, I'm just interested to try that, to be able to saturate your body enough to where all of a sudden it adapts to that and you don't feel like you're going to the bathroom. I think it does. And, 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 and the, the, when I can't like, you know, sometimes life circumstances, you're not always going to be able to drink a gallon of water every day. And uh, when I don't, mm -hmm. I notice an immediate effect. Like I don't, I don't have as much energy. I don't feel as good. I'm not as good as a, I'm, I'm in a, not a good mood. Um, it just, I think it has a dramatic effect on me. Like it's a, uh, it's an important part for me anyway. So, well, I just want another point, Jeff, and I'll say so, you now, yeah. it, that I think the other I, benefit of water is okay. Go ahead. Go feeling, ahead, go ahead. Full, feeling full because especially if you're dieting and you want to not, you want to, you don't want those hunger pains. I felt water was a pretty good tool to use at those times. So you're not yes. loading your body with calories. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. It's kind so, of an appetite. So here's the thing with water. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Right. yeah Jeff. So, so, so here, here's the thing with water. There's a little hesitation between us that, yeah. So unfortunately the audio could be a little bit off, but here's the thing with, uh, um, hydration and it's, there's a lot of information out there. So it's very confusing. If you're a very active individual, like you two are, and, uh, a gallon of water a day may be appropriate, but for an average person, a gallon of water a day is actually detrimental. It's what's called hypnotremia or water toxemia. It's the same thing. And what happens for an average person who consumes that much water, they actually flush the electrolytes and minerals out of their body. So if you're, you're a very active person, if you're a high performance person and you also perspire a lot, a gallon of water a day is good. But for the average person, the average person, the formula would be you want to take your body weight, divide it by two. And let's say I weigh 200 pounds, which I don't. Um, that would be 100. And that's how many ounces of water an average person should drink. Now, the more active you are, the more you're perspiring. If you're working outside, then you would add to that. But uh, again, it, it actually is detrimental for the average person to drink a gallon of water a day because they're flushing the electrolytes and the minerals out of their body. And what it will cause also... It will, even though it sounds odd, it will cause dehydration because their body, like you say, they, you get used to peeing and you're just peeing so much, you're flushing all the electrolytes and the minerals out that um, your body will actually need more water because the way our body sends signals to make our heart beat, make our brain function is through basically electrical impulses. And those electrolytes are what carry those electrical impulses. And so I'm sure you've heard the rare cases where people overdid water and they die because it, it, electrical it, impulses don't work anymore. So that's the danger of, yeah, that, it, that, that's it the danger with, of um, over consuming water. Right. Yeah. And what and what I didn't mention, too, is I, I put a few pinches of salt in my in my water as well. Mm -hmm. Because if yeah. you don't have that, it, right. like you're saying, it, it can actually, that condition can actually kill you. And that happens not frequently, but every once in a while to marathon runners where they're, they're constantly consuming water, straight water with no electrolytes in it. And then, and then, um, right. and, and flushing it all. Right. Right. That's a dangerous condition. Um, but all, you know, right. as long as you have enough sodium, if you don't have the sodium in your system, then the water can't get to where it needs to be. So, right. yeah, it's important. It's, it's important. It's, it's, That's it's a great a point. Sodium, yeah. It, yeah. 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 So it's sodium, potassium, magnesium. You could even use baking soda. Baking soda is very good as well. So the mm -hmm. um, so all, all the minerals uh, in the electrolytes. But the yeah. uh, so water consumption for the average person take your body weight divided by two and that's how many ounces of water you should drink now i'm going to talk about what i did for my nutrition which is not going to be for the average person because i was very thin i think i weighed about 152 pounds because i was i was running every day and i was doing martial arts and i had taken a break from weight training uh just because i wanted to get more heavily into martial arts and start doing some races and so i was running and doing martial arts and i was about i'm five foot eleven i was a hundred and 
about 52 pounds. I was very thin and I didn't like the way I looked, but I like, I like different activities. So I like doing that. But anyway, so what happened was when I saw the contest, I said, okay, I'm not happy with the way I look. I like being athletic, lean, fit, strong, but I want to have more muscle. So the, when I saw the contest, I said, okay, here's my opportunity to put the muscle back on. So as I mentioned in the, in the previous uh, podcast, I was taking in five to th- 6,000 calories a day. I would eat uh, basically every three hours, and that was every three hours, even if I was sleeping. And so it was uh, uh, eight meals a day, and uh, it was eight meals at about 600 to 700 calories per meal. And I would watch my body fat. So if I if I started to get a, gain a little body fat, because I still stayed very active, just like you guys did, if I started to see a little uh, body fat accumulation, uh, I would cut back on the calories a little bit. But my my nutrition was probably uh, about 60% protein, about uh, 25% fat, and about 15% carbohydrates. So those 15% carbohydrates were only vegetables. I didn't do any fruits. I didn't do any grains. I just wanted to be as healthy as possible. Uh as I was putting on all this muscle, so I knew, uh, you know, the low calorie, uh, high fiber, nutrient rich vegetables was going to be for me. And it allowed me to stay lean and take in a ton of calories and put on a bunch of muscle. But I will say that I I remembered after we did the podcast last time, Drew, you asked me if I had uh, cut back on the carbs uh, prior to the photo shoot. And I did. I did zero carbs. I basically did protein and fat for the last week to 10 days before the photo shoot. And uh, that allowed me to be lean. So um, anyways, guys, uh, sorry for everybody who's watching and you guys as well, that for the hesitation in between us speaking, but that's my internet and there's unfortunately nothing I can do about it. But the, uh, so next I want to talk about, I mean, do you guys have any more things you want to add about the nutrition before we move on to the next subject? Well, I just thought, you know, in, in listening to all three of us, I think really because um, we each had a slightly different approach. But I think the core element is um, carbohydrate management, because um, mm-hmm. in my case, um, I, I I had a higher carbohydrate load than you guys did, it sound like. But I was doing a ton of cardio, a ton. Mm-hmm. And um, and and I think as time went on, my strategy changed. I had the time to do it. I was motivated to do it. Um, but I think as time went on, I didn't want to you know have to do forty minutes of cardio or do the two you know the two times one in the morning and one in the evening. And I felt that moving towards um, a uh, a higher protein, higher fat approach seemed to work well. And and, you know, when they talk about ketosis, you're basically turning your body into a fat burning machine. And I felt like that s- approach mm-hmm. was easier in general. It's an easier approach to, to fat loss. Um, but I don't know from just gaining mass and being healthy, if that's the, the approach. I'll just wrap up my portion of that by saying, I think now I really kind of gravitated more to a Mediterranean style diet. I just find that that my body feels good with that. Uh, you know, I don't overdo the meats, plenty of <clears> vegetables <throat> and fruits, little dairy. That just seems to work well with my body. It eliminates cravings. Um, and it, it puts me in a position where if I need to lose weight quickly, and we are a Mediterranean diet, you can adjust those carbohydrates almost down to nothing. And you really are in keto pretty quick. Mm-hmm. And so that, that's, you know, I, I think again, um, mm-hmm. That, that at least from what I'm hearing is carbohydrates control seems to be a big factor in all this. Yeah, Drew. And that, that brings up something that I remember um, back when we were doing the that competition. I remember the last seven days, um, I on seven days before what I, I did a carbohydrate low uh, depletion and load, you know, which is kind of the thing to do back then in the bodybuilding world. Um so, and I remember exactly what I did because it was really simple. The first day I had uh, a small baked potato. I didn't weigh it, just a average size, half the size of your fist baked potato and, and a chicken breast every three hours. And then the second day I had a half of that potato and six chicken breasts. And uh, 
one every three hours. And then the third day I had just six chicken breasts. And I, although I didn't do a whole lot of cardio for that competition, I, I did cardio every day on that carb depletion. And then the next three days, I um, kept a small amount of protein in my diet, but more um, pasta, rice, um, some fruits and vegetables and small amount. And, and, and I kept the sodium out to, you know, uh, get that water out from under your skin. But then I remember that last week for me was dramatic change in, in, in my body right before the photo shoot. But you're missing carbohydrate, you know, control. And it just reminded me of that last week that, that I did. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think that again. So, I think so I want to. I want to say. Oh, go ahead. Oh, I, I was just going to say. You know, just from yeah, just from training so many people. You know, I've trained. Uh, if I count in my gyms and online, about seven thousand clients. The number one indicator of fat loss is the carbohydrates. I mean, as long as they were able to, uh, number one, eat the right carbohydrates which most of them can't. It's the most challenging part because when you're eating the proper carbohydrates, they're the boring ones. They're the, you know, the uh, vegetables, the sweet potatoes, you know, the the uh, stuff that's not that exciting, at least if you're really trying to get lean. Right. You know, the uh, if you're eating processed carbohydrates or even fruits in some cases will prevent you from getting too lean uh, and losing weight at a faster pace. But here's the thing with um, genetics plays a little bit of a role. So mm -hmm. based on genetics, 70% of the population should be on the Mediterranean diet. Now, based on my genetics, I'm, I should be on a Mediterranean diet. But the problem with that is I like to maintain a little bit more muscle. So I have to lean a little bit towards carnivore Mediterranean to maintain the muscle that I have. Now, based on genetics, again, it's 70% of the population should be on Mediterranean. About 22% uh, should be leaning towards carnivore. And this is based on our ancestors, the environments they were in, the, the way they ate. And then about 8% should be leaning more towards uh, vegan vegetarian, but nobody should be 100% really based on genetics, 100% carnivore, 100% vegan vegetarian. They should all always be, be uh, uh, they should be Mediterranean slash vegan vegetarian or Mediterranean slash carnivore. Uh, yeah. Not really purely vegan or not really purely carnivore, but that's genetics. No, anyway, I, so I anything else you guys want yeah, to add to that agree. before we move on? Yeah, I want to say that I agree with you 100%. In fact, um, when going into a bulking phase, that is exactly what I do. I just bump up the car, the uh, protein part of it. And then typically I would back mm -hmm. away from cheese or in a dairy. Just that simple move of increasing the, the, the protein. You're still getting the good carbohydrates in the Mediterranean diet generally. And cutting out uh, the dairy for whatever reason, uh, me cutting dairy helped me get a little leaner. That's a good that's a good strategy. And, and really, generally speaking, I think when we leave, if we leave this topic, somebody listening today, if they just if they really wanted to to keep this simple during your meal, if you have a protein source and a salad, or a protein source and mixed vegetables, that's a pretty simple approach, and it keeps you in a, in that mm -hmm. range of losing fat and still getting the nutrients you need. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so uh, that seems like it was a pretty great explanation of fat loss. Uh, and for me, that my goal wasn't fat loss, but I was able to maintain the lower body fat while I was gaining muscle. And it, again, it, it really boils down to your carbohydrates and then not just carbohydrates, but your choice of carbohydrates. So, lower calorie, uh, nutrient rich, fibrous. Uh, vegetables are really the ultimate choice if your goal is to get lean or stay lean. And that's the way I eat today, by the way. I eat still about 40% protein, about 40% uh, uh, healthy fats, and then about 20% carbohydrates. And I would say that almost always my carbohydrates are uh, fibrous, uh, high nutrient vegetables. I really do very little fruit. I do very oh, no grains, basically, and uh, just really very nutrient dense rich foods and i'm able to stay lean maintain my muscle of course and train hard as well but do you guys want to add anything else before we move on no i think we i think we did okay there 
It's interesting that we both, or we all three, um, okay. have just interesting approaches that are slightly different. They all yielded this basically the same result. Um, but the commonality is consistency of eating, keeping those carbohydrates low. Um, but Brad talked about earlier, when, when you do this, you need to be consistent. And it's once you just, no, yeah, we'll leave this segment with this. I noticed that when you create the habit, just you have to prepare those meals, whatever it's going to be, ideally protein source and vegetables. And I, I don't know that you even have to weigh it out that much. Just get in, yeah. have that consistently. And this, all, the, the fat loss, it's almost like magically happens in a sense. Yeah. You know, your, your body um, just starts getting leaner, just even without uh, exercise, I found. Yeah, and just and just having having the right mindset is is really important. You know, if if you don't have the uh, if you, if you don't have the right mindset and you're not determined enough, it's probably not going to happen. Yeah, and and I want to say one more thing regarding that, and then we'll move on. But so it, Brad is exactly right, and Drew, I'm sure will confirm it. It is the mindset, and here's the here's the here's the real answer. If you're emotions are dictating your actions you're you're gonna fail and so but so as long as your logic and your common sense are dictating your actions yeah. eating properly not skipping the training you're gonna win but if your emotions start to come into play where you say it's okay to eat this cheesecake it's okay to skip this workout when your emotions come into play you're you're pretty much screwed so you have to develop emotional control basically discipline well and just Along those same lines, that's why I had to do all the preparation in advance because life always throws all these obstacles <clears> and, you know, you think you're going to eat right and then you miss your meal and then you're trying to catch up. And it's like I couldn't deal with all that. And even if even though the contest was highly motivating and you think that alone would do it, but really it was the meals already being prepared so that no matter what, even if it was a stressful situation, when the clock hit, I could put it in the microwave and not think about it. And that was, for me, that was really the, the key to it. The combination of making it in advance with the motivation and it kept me on course. Yeah. So uh, I'm, I'm going to say one thing regarding that. So the other part is, so number one is emotional control. The second part is creating an environment that's conducive to success. So you have to make sure if you're going to decide you're going to get ripped, you can't have cookies in your cupboard. You can't walk by a pizza store and go have a slice. So you have to create the environment for success. And so that is a tough one for a lot of people because you could go to these people's homes that are consistently failing on their nutrition plans and you'll find crackers in their cupboards, cookies. And the reason they're failing is because they're not creating an environment that's conducive to success. So you need to create the environment with your living space, but also the people you surround yourself with. So uh, yeah. create the environment for success. Well, you know, I hate to keep saying we're going to leave this segment and then not, but that, that reminds me. Um, <laughs> Gosh, walk down memory lane. Do you did you guys ever take your myoplex and turn it into a pudding? Yes. Wasn't that an amazing? <laughs> that, was, that was great. Um, that was awesome. Yes. Yeah, and, that's, and and I I didn't want to leave this segment without that because you know let's face it, guys, we live in a world where sweets are all around us, and it is tempting. And I'm just as guilty as anybody. But what a joy that was. Because you're going to diet all the time and you want you don't want to wreck it. And then why not have a really kind of a, a nice protein style dessert? Man, that was good. And so, yeah, I, we probably should talk about, you know, the fact that you have you have a sweet tooth. There's plenty of protein powders out there today that you could mix with water into a pudding. And that's fantastic. Drop some nuts in there mm -hmm. even, you know, some of those type of things. Be, be a little creative on your sweet tooth side. And that helps a lot. It it does, Drew. And I've got I've got another one for you that I used to do. Um, the take all natural um, uh, unsweetened applesauce and put a couple spoons full of dry oats oatmeal on it mm. and mix it up. Oh my God! It's yeah. when you when you when you when you're hungry. That's really really yeah. good. Yeah. 
Jeff, what's uh, give us one of your your dessert so, uh, yes. favorites? Yeah. Well, I, I didn't do any desserts. I felt that like the shakes were sweet enough for me, and all I cared about was winning. So I just pounded everything down that I needed to pound down. But I do want to say, so Drew, I do want you to mention you have a supplement that you sell. So I, I'd like you to talk about the supplement you sell because it it uh, directly relates to what we're talking about, people with a sweet tooth. So I'd I'd like you to mention it. Drew didn't say, hey, promote my product. I'm just I want him to tell you about it just because it'll benefit the people that are struggling. Well. Um... Jeff, I'm sure you would um, support what I'm saying here because you work with so many people, but sweet tooths are a big problem. It's just a big problem. And so people get really motivated. I'm going to lose weight, New Year's resolution, or it's their birthday and I'm going to do it now. I'm finally going to do it. And about by the third, between the third and 10th day of that, I'm going to do it. Um, there's usually a, a point at which they, they give into their sweet tooth. I found it was typically the sweet tooth. It was the derailer. Um, and, um, it was only getting worse. It seems like, um, because there's so many things in, in our marketplace today, they're just, that are full of sugar. And I mean, a lot of sugar. And, um, so anyway, I felt like it was, I felt that there was an opportunity to create a product that might help. And I did, it's called sweet nothings. I sell it on Amazon and it's an herbal product that stops your cravings in about 60 seconds. Uh, and it does that because it, at the molecular level, it fills in the receptor sites of your tongue that taste sweet. So in 60 seconds, a Coke would taste like water or uh, an Oreo mm -hmm. cookie might taste like a Ritz cracker because you've eliminated all your body's ability to taste sweets. And what it does is it kind of shuts off that desire for, for wanting more. And why is that important? Because it doesn't take willpower to take the tablet. And once you take the tablet, it, if the, if the sugar, you're not getting the enjoyment from it, then it's much easier. It takes the willpower out of it. And so um, I've been selling that for years and it's just a, it's, um, it's one of these products. It's rare that, you know, that anything's working in 60 seconds, but mm -hmm. this one, you know, it's working in 60 seconds. The question is, do you want it to work? And the reason I say that is because people, when I say take it and I say, now try your favorite sweet, well, they take mm -hmm. it. Taste of their favorite sweet in 60 seconds and they realize they don't want it. And a lot of people go, but but I love my ice cream. And you've just made it so that I don't want my ice cream. And I don't know that I want that. You know what I'm saying? It's like you're you're taking a, a pleasure away from them. So works fantastic, works in 60 seconds, and it deals with the issue of uh not having the willpower to to stop yourself. So okay. Interesting product. Awesome. So, so uh, thank you. Yeah, thank you for that explanation, Drew. And so the uh, so now pretty much you guys got the the whole breakdown of what we did to lose weight, gain muscle, get in incredible shape, and actually make it into magazines uh, by following the this nutrition protocols that we talked about. So now what we're going to do is we're going to talk about a specific activity or supplement that we're going to take, and then we're going to report on our results from it. So I'm going to talk about a small molecule which a lot of people think is a peptide and drew's going to talk about hot and cold therapy and brad's going to talk about creatine so for i'm going to go ahead and start i'm going to talk about the uh small molecule that i'm going to take and so the the small molecule which a lot of people think is a peptide now peptides a lot of people don't know about peptides but what they are is actually just uh chains of individual amino acids and uh so anyways, this, this uh, peptides and small molecules are very, very popular in the fitness and sports community right now, and even in healing the body. And so what I'm going to start taking, and I'm going to start on Monday, I'm going to take a small molecule called 5-amino-1-MQ. Uh, and again, a lot of people think it's a, a peptide. It's not. Uh, but 5-amino-1-MQ, five, five it enhances what's called NNMT, which is nicotinamide in methyltransferase which is an enzyme that helps regulate cell metabolism improving mitochondrial function it does this by increasing nad plus levels and nad plus i don't know if people know much about it but um what really made nad and nmn uh, very popular is david sinclair a professor out of harvard university he wrote a book called lifespan 
And he talked about these genes that he discovered called sirtuins. And there's seven different sirtuins, and they have to do with aging in our body. And what this uh, NMN, which is what he created and he sells, uh, nicotinamide mononucleotide, is a precursor to NAD, which is nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide. And so the, the five amino helps elevate those NAD levels, which helps the sirtuins, uh, which are the genes in the body that help control aging, uh, become stronger and more healthy and slows down aging. So the, res the research on this five amino one and Q uh, shows, and I've seen it myself with my clients, because I do recommend this to some clients. What it does is it, is it increases the NAD plus levels, it uh, improves triglycerides, it lowers LDL cholesterol, it improves insulin sensitivity, it improves uh, contractile force of the muscles. So you actually can lift harder and uh, jump higher, run faster. And it also has the anti-aging benefits of the NAD plus. So the, um, the five amino one and Q, uh, one thing that makes it a little bit more popular is most peptides are injectable. The small molecules, uh, five amino one MQ comes in pill form. And so a lot of people don't like doing these uh, little insulin needle injections. So the pill form, I'm going to take 100 milligrams a day. Uh, the recommended dosage is 50 to 150 milligrams a day. I'm going to do right there in the middle. And I will say I've done five amino one MQ once before. And one of the things that I really liked about it, it increases your cardiovascular capacity and it enhances recuperation. So when I train hard, I'm able to um, not get as fatigued and I also recuperate faster. And then on top of that, it will also help shed a little bit of fat. So if you're having that last little bit of fat that's tricky, the 5-amino-1-MQ uh, helps metabolize fat cells. And it also speeds up your metabolism a little bit. But the thing that I really liked was the increased endurance and the increased recuperation. And I will say the with peptides and small molecules, they're not a miracle. And so they, the more fit, lean, and healthy you are, the better they work. Now, if somebody's more than 15% body fat, you're not going to notice much from uh, peptides and small molecules. But the more fit and healthy you are, the more uh, you are able to see and feel the results. And so um, always you get down to easily, you know, the 15% body fat just by doing what we've talked about. Do your nutrition, do your workout. You're going to get below 15% body fat. Then if you want to take that to the next level, add a little icing on the cake, that would be peptides. That would be small molecules. And 5-amino-1-MQ is the one I'm going to do. I'm going to report back on it. Usually 5-amino-1-MQ, uh, you only want to be on it four to six weeks. And then you start to get what's called receptor attenuation, where you're, uh, it's not quite as effective. Just like when you first start drinking a cup of coffee, one coffee gets you wired. Then you need two coffees and you need three. And so you get receptor attenuation. You get that with a lot of peptides as well. So you want to switch them up. But anyway, so that's what I'm going to start taking on Monday. And then I'm going to report back to you guys uh, next time we do this, which will be in two weeks. And I'll tell you what I'm feeling at that point. And then I'll talk about the next time as well. But anyway, so that's what I'm going to do. And so uh, who wants to go next and talk about what they're doing? Brett. Yeah. Um, so uh, I'm doing the hot, cold, um, cold plunge uh, sauna therapy. And man, guys, I'm, I'm excited about this. I... Yeah, I didn't tell you guys this before that we did the podcast, but I'm all set up in my garage now with a with a cold plunge tub and a sauna. <laughs> Wasn't that wow. cool? <laughs> so, wow. so, so just wait, I want to I'm going to wow. do my first I'm going to do my very first uh, one tonight. So and then um, I've got a it's one of the little portable saunas and uh, but a, a, and a cold plunge tub. So. But, you know, the sauna and it's it's a therapy that I've wanted to try for a long time. And I just I just I just haven't done it because who wants to really crawl into a tub full of ice water? But mm -hmm. I'm, I'm going to do it tonight. And but there's a lot of um, you hear a lot of good reduced inflammation, um, detoxification with the sauna. And another thing with the sauna, I know in the cycling community. Uh, sauna treatment without the cold plunge, just the plain old sauna treatment is um, good for, they say that, that it, it could uh, cause your kidneys to uh, secrete a, uh, EPO, which is good for the red blood cell formation. And 
any type of athletic event, any just athletic ability, red blood cells are, are the, are the thing to have because that's what carries the oxygen to the muscle. So I'm really looking forward to that. And, um, so my plan is, uh, and I'm going to be able to really test it. I'm going to, I'm going to try it tonight. And then, um, not only subjectively see how I feel because I've got a probably, it's probably the hardest 55 mile mountain bike off road mountain bike race in the Midwest tomorrow morning. It's uh, called the Ozarks one eyed dog. And, mm. um, it's 55 miles of pretty rough single track. And I know what I feel like after, after a six hour mountain bike race, I, you know, I know what I feel like. So I'm going to cold plunge sauna treatment tonight. And then as soon as I get back tomorrow, I'm going to do it again. And so I'll be able to report back subjectively how I feel compared to how I would normally feel after an athletic event like that. And then uh, some objective measurements too. Uh, Cause I keep track of my, my resting heart rate and my HRV status. And um, I'll see how those numbers are. I know what those numbers are after, a, after a, where they are when I'm recovered and where they are after a race. And we'll see how the cold plunge uh, sauna treatment aids. We should be able to tell subjectively and objectively if, if, it, if, it, if it's going to work or not, but um I'll, 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 I'm going to take a video and post it on uh, Facebook tonight. So if anybody wants to watch, I'm going to, I'm going to, yeah, I'm going to take the plunge, good. take the plunge tonight. Oh, wow. Mm. You know what I, so, Brad, so, uh, I, uh, uh, uh. <laughs> I think we have a, so delay. anyways, I'll, 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 I'll say something. So yeah. yeah, yeah. Sorry about the delay, everybody. But anyway, so one thing I do want to say about sauna and cold plunge, um, these are, these are, things that add to your your longevity and healthy aging so the cold therapy which is uh, the cold plunge which he's going to do which i will say most people don't stick to that because it truly is miserable um but it it helps your body release what are called cold shock proteins which actually make you more resilient more durable and the uh so the cold shock proteins also it helps to contribute to what's called brown fat and brown fat is the very healthy fat that's on our body that also aids in longevity and aging and it's usually uh held pretty much between the the shoulder blades and the upper back that's the majority of it and it's a uh, very beneficial for health and longevity the other thing that it does <clears throat> is is or i'm going to talk about the uh sauna one thing that's about the sauna that uh, releases heat shock uh proteins which is also massively beneficial to longevity but the one thing i want to talk about with sauna that very few people are aware of is when you're in there and you're sweating uh your skin is the second largest organ on the body and so we're we're, we're perspiring out toxins and heavy metals and so you do not want to let that sweat dry back up on your body because you will reabsorb those toxins so once you get out of the sauna shower off immediately or at least wipe all that sweat off with a, a towel to make sure you get those heavy metals and toxins off your skin so you don't reabsorb them but very very beneficial for longevity um and uh so anyways i'll let you guys go ahead that's a hey that's a great point jeff i'm glad you brought that up because i, I didn't I, di I never thought of that i didn't i didn't think about the toxins being on your skin after you get out of the sauna uh, I think I'll go to the shower and not back in the cold tub. But <laughs> um, another thing I wanted to add, we were talking about mindset, you know, and I'm just going to, I'm going to do, uh, I'm going to do a little meditation before I get in that cold, cold uh, ice water, because we were talking about mindset. And I think one of the things with the cold plunge too, is you're training your mind how to be comfortable in an uncomfortable situation. And I, I think that can't be anything but 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 helpful for for everything involved. But I'm going to give a full report, and I'm going to give it. I'm going to I'm going to do a lot of it, a lot of this. Well, Brad, I, I'm excited to see how this works because my perspective is in line with what Jeff just said in terms of the benefits. But I'm going to take the scientific element out of it and just present what I'm personally experiencing as it relates to. Um, my um, susceptibility to cold. And if you remember, we have a home care agency, so we're really kind of immersed in older patients. And to see how um, their 
their tolerance to cold there uh, is just it's it's unbelievable how as they get older they don't even want to get out of bed because just the air temperature from the bed uh, underneath the covers and out and what was interesting is um i, I i'm a, a scuba diver but i haven't done it in years and um i'm finding that my own cold tolerance has gone down significantly um, you know, you see young kids are running in, especially in California, the ocean is cold and they're running in and out and doing all this stuff. And that's the stuff right. I used to do probably even into my forties, I was still kind of hanging out and doing, um, body surfing and stuff. And now it's like, oh, I, I just don't want the sheer unenjoyment of the feeling. It, and, and it, I came to this interesting realization that in looking at the, our clients and looking at what I'm experiencing, I believe there is a correlation between your cold tolerance and the, your long, your, your, the, your, what I want to say, your essence, your energy, your, your longevity, your, your age, it, your, your tolerance to cold seems to be tracking with, as you get older, if that tolerance goes down, there's a whole element of your body that is degrading. And, and if you cannot tolerate cold, I believe that affects your immune system. I believe it affects yeah. your cardiovascular system and your hormonal system. And these are the very things that you see degrading as you get older. And so um, even though I haven't done the cold plunge yet, I'm trying to get my mindset as well to do something like this. I believe it is um, it's something that we should do as we get older because it is a I don't know if there's even any science behind it, but I believe there is a tie between your ability to handle cold and your immunity, your, your strength of your immune system and your strength of your cardiac system. And um, so it'll be great, uh, Brad, to see, because you're already in great cardiovascular shape, um, but it'll be interesting to see how you feel and how that, how you can toughen up mentally to do that. And if you feel any, any more robust, I'm just curious if you feel literally more robust and more youthful, the better you can tolerate that. I right. It's gonna be it's gonna be very interesting, Drew. I, I'm so excited about trying it. Good. Well, uh as for me, um I um was already starting just coincidentally uh doing creatine for the first time in six years. And um, you know, interestingly enough, when I first I took it for the first time for the contest. And I have to say that I noticed a difference. I know that was a supplement that I really felt made a difference in my muscle mass. Yeah. Um, so I started about a week and a half ago, but I'm not on a bulking program. I just wanted to observe if I was, what, what it was going to do to me. It, I'm older. So I, I believe my creatine levels are low. And um, interestingly enough, uh, I haven't gotten a bulking program, so I'm not, I'm not training to gain muscle mass, but I did notice um, a slight increase in the way my shirts are fitting, just a, a little bit more fullness. And interestingly enough, also on muscle pump, um, just even doing exercises that were not necessarily where I'm, I'm doing three sets of 10 and you're know, really trying to tear that muscle fiber down. I just felt stronger. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I know there's the placebo effect. But I really think I can discount it in this case because I've been at this long enough that I, I kind of can feel and, and see those differences minutely without being influenced by the placebo effect. And um, I didn't do the loading. I, I didn't feel like I needed to because I wasn't on a bulking phase. I just started taking the five gram servings once a day with water. Um, no, no juice or no sugar. And, um, I found I've tolerated it very well. Uh, no, none of the stomach bloating and some of the things that some people say they've had. Um, and so, uh, I'm just going to keep at this five grams. I am planning, um, over the course of the next few weeks to start implementing more weight training and just get a feel for, um, you know, what this is, is doing. But I, I, I can say, um, from my experience, if I had to pick uh, a supplement or two that I felt everybody should try, I think creatine's one, and um, the other one maybe be a protein shake, only because it's just a sheer convenience of getting calories and it takes care of your sweet your sweet tooth. But um, 
we'll see over the next uh, few weeks to a couple of you know, few months where this where I where my opinion is on it. But if it's anything like the first time around and it seems to be, it's a positive effect. Yeah. So so um, I want to say something about creatine. Um, I when I did the uh, body of work challenge, I took every supplement that EAS made. And I just just because I wanted to win. So I took every supplement they made. So I didn't know what was doing what. And um, but what happened was I quit taking supplements probably 10 years ago is when I quit taking supplements, basically. But then, you know, I know all the research, the science behind creatine. So about a year ago, I said, you know what? Let me give creatine a try. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. The uh, I would say my my strength. And my endurance went up about 10%. It had steroid-like effects. My It went up about 10%. And also the muscle. I probably gained two pounds of muscle from it, solid muscle. Now, now a lot of people do have um, problems with bloating from creatine. And one of the things that can help with the bloating is if they take small micro doses throughout the day. Like if they do two grams in the morning, two grams at noon, and two grams at night, that usually will prevent the bloating. So uh, five grams is generally what you want to take. And what the recent science and research shows, you do not need to load. You just take five grams a day. And the the um, creatine is created naturally by us in our pancreas, our kidneys, our liver. And, and 95% of that creatine is stored in our muscle tissue. The other 5% has everything to do with heart, healthy heart function and healthy brain function. And what they show is, Women especially benefit more from creatine than men do because they have 70 to 80 percent less creatine stores than a man does. And on top of that, elderly people, the biggest benefits of creatine they get because it improves cognition. It improves even depression. It improves their strength. It improves uh, their their uh, energy. So creatine, which we create naturally, but we don't we create less and less of it as we age, just like hormones, they diminish as we age. Uh, the older and the, the women can benefit more from creatine. But for me, even a healthy fit guy that was already in top shape, once I included creatine, it, it was it was better than I expected. And that's all I added. I had simply added creatine. I take 10 grams a day just because I go out and I do my sprints in the middle of the day and then I train uh, with weights a little bit later in the day. So I do a little bit more training. So I don't suggest anybody take more than 10 grams a day. Not that it's detrimental, it's not. Some people believe it's bad for the liver. It's not, they're they're thinking of creatinine, which is different. And so the, the uh, so five grams a day, no need to load. Everybody on the planet could benefit from creatine. Anyway, so uh, Brad, was there anything you wanted to add to that or Drew? No, I, I think you're tying it's your reference to being uh, especially helpful for older people. I think um, I, I I don't know anybody uh, that um, that I'm aware of that's older that's taking creatine. And with sarcopenia, and it may be worth having a discussion about sarcopenia in the future. But I mean, it's devastating. Uh, we watch patients that um, mm -hmm. are mobile and they get sick. Uh, for some reason and be immobile for a few days. And the amount of muscle wasting that occurs in just a few days is devastating. Uh, and it's shocking because, you know, normally people, when they are uh, immobile for a few days, it, when you're younger, you're not losing muscle mass, but you do lose substantial muscle mass. You get older. So I suspect the creatine levels may play a part in that. I don't know for sure, but it just seems like, um, as uh, I'm like Jeff, I, I just felt like uh, creatine has is one of those supplements that you can tell is working. And it, it seemed like it would be reasonable that they would start um, maybe looking at that as a potential um, uh, way to reduce sarcopenia as they get older. So, well, I, you know, this is a great conversation, guys. I haven't tried, I haven't taken any creatine for years. And, um, I don't know. I'm a little motivated now to see. I remember the effects of it, um, right. but yeah, yeah. I think I'm going to give it. I think yeah. I give it a shot myself. Yeah, Brad. I'm surprised because you know, seriously, you're in a sport that takes incredible endurance. I mean, really. I mean, it's it's tough, 
And um, I'd be really curious is because um, you also have notebooks and you really keep records to how that would impact your. Um, yes. You know, like, yeah. Yeah. So, I'm, um, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to give it a try. We, I've got, uh, yeah. five, I've got five more, uh, races this year and they're all kind of boom, 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 right next to each other. Um, all the way till the first week of November, um, which is the last one down in Austin, Texas. Um, so I think, uh, maybe it's a little too, uh, late to try it for this one tomorrow, oh, yeah. but I think, I, I think I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to give it a go. Yeah. Yeah. I'd be curious how that works out. Yeah. So, so you guys, that was a phenomenal podcast today. You guys, really great information. I appreciate it. And the uh, so, what we're going to do is we're going to do this right now uh, every two weeks, and we're going to come in here and we're going to report on our progress on the things we just spoke about. But we're going to be trying new things along the way also. And if anybody has any suggestions on what path you think we should take with our discussions, go ahead and give us your input. Put comments in the comment section. Uh, but Anyways, this was really exciting, insightful, and for anybody that wants to improve their health and fitness, you could learn a lot from this because we all, if you go back and look at our pictures, are perfect examples who people of people who were just normal people that weren't in great shape. And we are in the probably the top 1%, uh, possibly even the top 1% of the 1% right now. And so the uh, I just want to thank you guys so much. Is there anything else uh, you guys want to add to this? No, I'm just glad to be here. It's fun to hang out with you guys. Yeah, uh, this is the same with me. This is, uh, I think this is going to be a phenomenal podcast. Uh, super excited about talking to you guys. It's it's great. It's great to uh, be with you guys again after all these years. And uh, I think we're gonna we're gonna come up with a lot of good information. And and I think um, it's gonna it's gonna be interesting. If you want to, uh, you know, better yourself and 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 improve your life. And I, I, I think this is going to be a good thing here. Looking forward to it. Yeah. 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 Thank, thank you guys for uh, tuning in and thank uh, Drew and Brad and, you know, we're, we're going to be back. So if you want to learn more, you want to look better, feel better, just improve your overall quality of life, watch our podcast. Anyways, thanks everybody. Take care.